From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Arneson Dollar. You can come down any time you want to. I'm still at the hospital. Thanks, Lieutenant. How's the driver? He's not going to live either. The doctors doubt they can bring him around for a statement. Oh? Uh-huh. What about the loss? Has the amount been figured out yet? Pretty close. Almost $250,000. I don't suppose there's a chance, but was any of it marked or listed by serial number? Very little of it. You'd better come down. If the driver does regain consciousness, we may get something. If he doesn't, we'll be starting pretty much in the dark. I guess both of us have done that before. All right, Lieutenant Anderson. I'll be right down. Edmund O'Brien in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the month-end raid matter. Expense account item one, $108.25, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Kansas City, Missouri, where I arrived some seven hours after the company had advised me of the loss sustained by armed robbery by the Andover chain of department stores. The first details I received were sketchy. At the finish of a four-day month-end sale, the armored truck that had picked up the receipts from three branch stores had been robbed. One guard had been killed at the scene. The driver, Carl Biller, was dying at 11.30 that night when I met Lieutenant Arneson in the hospital corridor. Dr. Surrey, report. I'm afraid I talked her into a wasted trip down here. Just saw the doc again. They're giving Biller less than an hour to live now. His wife just went into the room. Never came back at all, huh? No. I've been with him most of the time and had a man there when I wasn't. What did you expect him to give you, Lieutenant? Uh, I'm not sure. According to witnesses, he and the guard were shot down by one of the men in cold blood. Not because they resisted the killers. Why? To eliminate them, maybe. Why? Because the victims knew the killer, maybe. In spite of the mask they were wearing. That's what I hope Dr. you tell me. Curry, That's the point. How about these witnesses? Are they any good? Good as most. The picture seems to have been two cars, both sedans. One of them was in the passenger loading zone when the armored truck arrived and parked in front of it. These men knew when and where, then? They sure did. They knew the truck had picked up the receipts at the end of the stores across the... in Kansas City, Kansas, and in Independence, and the one car was waiting for them at the store here. The other car double parked when the money came out. The men were shot down... And the truck was empty before anybody turned in an alarm. How about license numbers? Dr. Both Curry, on the stolen car list. Report. You can work any way you want a dollar. I won't get in your road. Thanks, Lieutenant. We're both aiming for the same thing, and I'm going to have my hands full. Robbery detail tells me their informers have hinted that a gang has been forming here in town for the last month or two. I guess they were right. We're pulling in everybody we can. Maybe we can get some talk out of some of them. It'll be a slow process, but that's the way we work. I'll be in my... Oh, oh yes, Cole. Is he gone? There was nothing they could do. Well, that finishes that. This is Mr. Dollar, Sergeant Cole. How are you, Sergeant Cole? Dollar's investigating for the insurance company. Yeah, but they're hurting, huh? I've seen them in better moods. Um, were you planning on talking to the widow tonight, Lieutenant? Follow up the possibility that he knew the killers? What kind of condition is she in, Cole? Mm, hard to tell. She seemed to be standing up all right. I'd just as soon leave it to you tonight, Dollar. Cole and I ought to get back to headquarters and see what we've pulled in. Sure, Lieutenant. Anything you say. A short time later, a white-sheeted figure was rolled out of the Biller room, followed in a couple of minutes by Mrs. Biller, a plain, lumpy woman in her 40s. In silence, she followed me into an empty waiting room a few yards down the corridor. I want to go home. I've been here all day and I'm tired. I can certainly understand that, Mrs. Biller, and I won't keep you long. This may seem like a strange question under the circumstances, but do you think there could have been anything personal connected with your husband's death? Personal? We're looking for a valid reason for Mr. Biller and the other men being shot down the way they were. What are you talking about? I wouldn't he get shot. It didn't surprise me. He was always with a lot of money, and I told him he'd get shot someday. There was no apparent reason, Mrs. Biller. They weren't given time to try to protect the money. They didn't draw their guns. Private guards worked under orders to surrender as a rule, but they weren't given a chance. They were met on the sidewalk and killed without a word. I haven't been thinking about anything like that all day long. 
He'd been wondering what would happen if he died. Now he has. And here I am with a house still not paid for and no money. I just have to face it. Dead and that's all there is to it. You'd want to help us find the man who killed him if, if you could, wouldn't you? How could I help you do that? He and the other man could have been killed because they knew the man who killed him. How could anything like that be? Why should Carl know anybody like that? We don't know that he did. We only wonder. And I read the papers. How could he know anybody when they were all wearing masks? That could mean that he knew them very well. Well enough to recognize them in spite of the masks. Don't you see what I mean, Mrs. Billen? I can't think. You couldn't expect me to think after a day like this has been. I don't know what to say. I'm all mixed up now. I understand, Mrs. Billen. I won't bother you anymore tonight. What we want to know is if somebody who knew your husband and knew quite a lot about his job could have been responsible for his death and the robbery. We'll talk to you about it again. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Lieutenant Arneson thought enough of the interview and the widow's reaction to assign a couple of men to keep her covered. The police spent most of that night pulling in known and suspected criminals and grilling them without any definite success. The next morning, I was in the lieutenant's office while he was waiting for one of his informers to be brought in. Nothing on the missing cars yet, Dollar, but I'm dead certain they haven't got out of town. We had it sewed up in a hurry. I put another man on a biller angle, too, looking into his habits and friends, but staying away from his wife. We'll save her for you. Thanks a lot. I thought you'd like her. Here's the count, Lieutenant. Yeah, come on in, Emil. This is Emil Ordorff, sometimes called the count. Sit down, Emil. Emil and I have known one another for a long time, haven't we, Emil? I owe the lieutenant a deep debt of gratitude. We get along. Emil, this man's working for the insurance company that covered the missing money. You can trust him. If you say so, what else? What's going on in town, Emil? What does the crowd say about this heist? They don't say very little. They don't like this. These are foreigners who do this. From where? Chicago. The crowd don't like this. Doesn't look like a foreign job to me. They knew just where that armored truck would be and were waiting for it. How would outsiders get information like that? Who are these foreigners and where are they? Where they are, I don't know. Who? I hear only some names that are nothing. One is Pinky, one other is Ross. First name or last? Only Ross. Other is Shorty, other is the Mick. Who their other names are, nobody knows. He's not much, Lieutenant, but I am only a man. Anything more, Johnny? Yeah. You know if they're still here in Kansas City? How do I know that? So I, from the crowd, am the only one who knows where they are? Then I am shot, too? The Lieutenant seemed to be fairly sure that the men and the money were still in town. All the escape routes had been covered by police armed with composite descriptions of more than 30 witnesses to the shooting. The information given us by the informer was almost worthless, but the first names and aliases were wired to Chicago for a search. And the officer working on the bill angle came up with a development later that same afternoon. So I was armed with at least something definite when I went out to see the widow. Hello. Hope you're feeling better today. Some ways I do, some ways I don't. You can come in. Thank you. Mrs. Bella, I learned some things this afternoon that I hope you've been thinking about. What? Your husband and this woman named Betty Clare. I was going to tell you. What do you know about it? She's married to a man who just got out of prison. I was going to tell you. I knew she'd get him into trouble sooner or later. I did all I could to get him away from her. Even wrote a letter to the bonding company that she was nobody to be hanging around somebody with Carl's work. He saw her after her husband was paroled? Oh, not so much, I guess. But the husband was away sometimes. I don't know. I guess Carl went to see her some then. You must have thought of her when I talked to you last night. I did. There's no use lying. Why didn't you mention her? I don't know. Maybe I was ashamed of having a husband some other woman could keep a hold on until she got him killed. And you think their association was one where he would have told her details about his job? Yes. Now you'll admit that you think she had something to do with the robbery. Yes. 
Because Carl didn't come home night before last. I don't know where he was. But he came here in the morning to change into his uniform. Then he left. That was the morning he was killed. Did you ask him where he'd been? No. I got over doing that quite a while ago. Has she been arrested? Not yet. Lieutenant Arneson is waiting for me. We wanted to get what you had to say before we talked to her. Do you have anything more? No. Except I hope she gets hurt as much as she's made me get hurt. I think that's all then, Mrs. Villa. Sorry you didn't mention this last night. Hope we aren't too late now. Get over to the side. You never know. I guess we're safe. Pretty clear. She's been choked to death. We will return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. There's lots of good folding money and an hour of merriment and music on hand again tonight when CBS presents Sing It Again. The Phantom Voice brings an extra tingle of excitement and pays off handsomely when Jan Murray uses that coast-to-coast -coast phone. Here's Sing It Again on CBS Tonight. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Betty Clare had been strangled, obviously, by a pair of hands. The apartment showed signs of a struggle, but further search revealed only a newspaper whose date and time seemed to indicate that she'd been killed after Carl Villa had died. There wasn't a lead as to the possible whereabouts of her husband, Arnold Clare, but the search for him was speeded up. At five, a report from a section of Kansas City called East Bottom did give us a lead. The body of a man was found in a garage. He'd been shot to death, and in his pocket was a receipt for an insured parcel post package. A follow-up on the receiver's address showed the package to contain $15,000 in cash. Later, the informer, Emil Ordoff, followed the lieutenant and me in to view the body. Okay, Charlie. You know this man, Emil? How could I be sure? He's one of the crowd. I know who he is. Do you? His name is Norworth? You know it is? Yes, I know. Earl Norworth, with a record of narcotics possession, suspicion of burglary, 60 days last year in vagrancy and carrying a concealed weapon. Yes, Earl Norworth. The lieutenant tells me he's not from Chicago, Emil, that he's a local boy. Yes. You still say the Andover job was pulled by Chicago men? This is what I think, what the talk is. I also told Dollar that I never could really trust you, Emil. Mm. There was always a chance somebody might buy you into bringing me false information. Oh, no. Couldn't somebody who just made a $200,000 haul buy you into it, Emil? Oh, no. Money's not going to do you any good if I find out you aren't leveling with me. I've got about four charges I can bring against you. They send you up for quite a while. I owe you deep gratitude. I tried to find out more, so you let me go now. I'll give you the rest of the evening up to 10.30, Emil. One thing you don't have to find out. Nor with here... Sent 15 grand out of the city by mail. There's only one reason he'd do that. He was mixed up with the Andover job. Now get going. I'll pick you up later. The two additional killings, possibly linked to the robbery, set Kansas City's underworld and police force spinning. Every officer in town was put on duty until further notice. By 8, the tanks were filled with hoodlums, while the streets and hangouts were strangely empty and silent. At 9 o'clock, it seemed that things started to break. A known associate of Arnold Clare was picked up 
and brought to the lieutenant's office. Sure, sure I know Arnold. I was in prison with him. I met his wife the other night, but I don't know anything about the Andover job. Where were you the morning it was pulled? Listen, I got alibis to prove I wasn't mixed up in nothing. What about Arnold Clare? As far as I know, he was going straight. That's what he told me, anyway. We've got Clare linked up pretty close. We know his wife was running around with the driver of that armored truck. That would give Clare access to the information he'd need. Uh, well, I can't help what his wife was up to. He told me he was going straight. He said he was looking for a job. When did he say that? Last time I saw him, the other night when I met his wife. Tuesday it was. Tuesday night? Yeah. Robbery came off Wednesday morning. And you were with Claire and his wife Tuesday night. That's right. I tell you, I don't think he had nothing to do with it. How late were you with him? Oh, it must have been 1.30, 2 in the morning. And Betty Claire was there all the time? That's right. Doesn't jive with Mrs. Biller's story, Lieutenant. Look, I'm telling the truth. I got no reason to lie. How about proof? Was anyone else there? Yeah, yeah, somebody else was there. We ordered some liquor sometime around midnight. The boy from the liquor store brought it up. I forgot the name of the place, but I can show you. Mrs. Biller said her husband was with Betty Clare the night before the robbery. That ain't true. Nobody was with her but Arnold and me. I'll take you to that liquor store. And she was killed yesterday, the day after Biller died. What? What? Who was killed? Are you sure Biller wasn't with you and Betty Clare and her husband? You're telling me Betty Clare is dead? You know she is. Strangled. Now tell us why. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't know anything about it. I swear I didn't. I I'll tell you where Arnold is to prove I didn't know. What kind of proof is that? I didn't know. I swear I didn't. He didn't tell me. He said there was too much heat on from the Andover job. And he didn't have an alibi for the whole morning. He said he wanted to stay out of sight for a while. Sure. Make himself look innocent, I suppose. I don't care what you think. That's what he told me, and that's all. But if his wife has been killed, I don't want to have nothing more to do with him. That's a real double cross to get me mixed up in anything like that. I'm through with him. Where is he? There's a shack out by the edge of town near the river. I've been taking food to him. Let's get started. Lieutenant means you, Stone. Now, look, you, you ain't going to make me go with you. Ain't I, ain't I, ain't it enough I tell you where he is? You're the first real live hunk of progress we've had. We want to hang on to you. Come on. Uh, he'll kill me if he gets a chance. We'll try and see that he doesn't get one. Lieutenant. Yes, Cole. Bad news. They caught up with Emil Ordoff. He's dead? Yeah, the report just came in. Well, that's too bad. He's a good, honest story, and I'm going to miss him. Is it better stop, don't you think? The town is really hot. I can't remember it ever being this hot. We checked Stone's story at the liquor store. The delivery boy finally remembered and agreed that only Stone had been with the Clares in the apartment the night before the robbery. Twenty minutes later, with headlights out, our car pulled up on a dirt road. The shack Stone pointed out was screened by a stand of willows on the riverbank. One small window showed some light from inside. Wait. Wait a minute. I ain't going in there. You can't make come me. Come on, come on, come on. He'll kill me. No, he won't, Stone. Let's go. I tell you, he'll kill me. My case, I'll take it. There we are, Claire. Who are you? Stone. Stay in the chair. Lieutenant Arneson, homicide. Stall, you sold me out. Don't try it, Claire. You lied to me, Arnold. You lied to me. You didn't tell me about your wife. And you was getting me mixed up in a killing. Well, that don't set with me. And I called you my Settle friend. Come back, Claire. You want to check him for weapons, Jenny? Sure. Relax, Claire. You can't do yourself any good by making a play. Stand up. I won't make a play. There's a 38 in my left coat pocket. Uh -huh. You can sit down, huh? Why do you want to start, Claire? I, uh, I guess it don't make much difference, does it? Why'd you kill your wife? What makes you so sure I... Uh, all right. I killed her because I was trying to go straight this time. And she got mixed up in this Andover job. If I'd known about it before, I'd stopped it for sure, but, but I didn't find out until after it happened. How did you find out? One of the guys that got killed, the, the driver, Biller. His wife got me on the phone the night he died. She told me about... about Betty and her husband. You didn't know about it? No, I end? didn't know. This dame told me about it. All the years I was in prison. And after I got out, every chance they had. Is that the only reason you had? I told you I was trying to go straight. And I found out Betty is working this building to setting up a job with her. She was doing it to get rid of me again. 
She knew the board would take my parole away, no matter what I said. Mrs. Biller told you all this? Her husband talked about it before he died. You're a stupid fool. Kyle. Sure I am, sure, but I couldn't help it. I went crazy. Betty wasn't at home when I found out. I, I guess I drank a lot and, and thought about it. And when she came home, I just grabbed her. I couldn't help it. I knew I was killing. I couldn't stop. <laughs> you know something? I don't care. That's the spirit. What about the Andover job? How much do you know about that? I, I know one guy that was in on it, and I'll finger him for you. I'll finger him. I'll see some of them take the same trip I'm taking. From the break Stone gave us, the case snowballed. The man Claire took us to led us to another, and he to another. It went that way until 4.30, when all that remained were the men from Chicago we'd heard of earlier. They were holed up in a house together, and one of them, Ross Degnan, had been the killer during the job. He'd killed for no reason, except that he'd been under the influence of narcotics. Dawn was just beginning to break when the stakeout was drawn around the house. I don't move faster than I wanted to. One of the men who got here before we did says he heard a phone ringing in the house. They've been tipped then. Huh? Probably. Sergeant Cole? Ready to go, Lieutenant? I think so. You cover me with a Thompson from the driveway, near the porch there. Yeah. You aren't forgetting those sort of shotguns, are you? Not going to get within range. Not me. We'll try to call them out in the street. Oh, wait. Car starting. Where is it? The garage. It got into the garage. The garage! You men in the back! Cover the garage! Watch it. Here they come. Thompson, Cole, use it! Get the driver! It had been a long night, but we saw the end of the trouble there on the street. What the Chicago men had with them and stolen money brought the recovery up to within $2,000 of the original amount. Expense account item two, $180, miscellaneous item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $396.50. Remarks? I talked to Mrs. Biller before I left hoping to get some kind of revenge against the woman who'd stolen her husband, she told Arnold Clare that Betty had set up the robbery. But she got her revenge, murder. And the company owes her a deep debt of gratitude because when that broke, the whole thing broke. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dodd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien's latest picture is a Paramount Pictures production, The Redhead and the Cowboy. Featured in tonight's cast were Herb Butterfield, Joe Duvall, Virginia Gregg, Edgar Barrier, Sidney Miller, and Peter Leeds. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dick Cutting inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Do you know that there's one fire in an American home every 20 seconds? That fires kill 11,000 people every year? Staggering, isn't it? 90% of fires in the home start through carelessness. Be careful with matches and keep them out of the reach of children. And if you're a careless smoker, don't smoke in bed or discard lighted cigarettes thoughtlessly. Don't gamble with fire. The odds are against you. Stay tuned now for five minutes of the latest news. This is CBS, where our Miss Brooks holds classes every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.